Thank you for joining us in this presentation. This presentation is about how to deal with facial trauma in a conflict zone, in an area where resources are limited and specialist services are limited. Now, this presentation is targeted towards medics for Myanmar. In this presentation, first we will cover lower jaw fractures, then we will discuss dentoalveolar fractures. Dentoalveolar fractures are the fractures of the teeth and the supporting bone without the fracture of the jaw. And finally, we will cover upper jaw fractures. So first, let us start with lower jaw fractures. In a scenario where a peaceful demonstration faces violent suppression resulting in a facial injury, your first concept would be that of scoop and run. That is to transfer the casualty quickly out to a safe zone. Your first challenge will be to prevent this patient from fainting. The patient might not have consumed any food or water for a protracted period of time. And, and the patient therefore will be predisposed to collapsing and fainting. So if the patient can swallow, get some food or fluid down the patient's mouth as soon as possible. Your first challenge would be if you're faced with something like this. This is a floating fractured mandible. It is an unstable fracture of the lower jaw and the patient is unable to swallow any food or fluid. What can you do under those situations? In that case, what you can do is take any rough piece of cloth, grasp the tip of the patient's tongue and pull the tongue downwards and forwards. As you pull the tongue downwards and forwards, it exposes the posterior third of his tongue. And then you can take any food with a gel-like consistency. For example, honey, tomato ketchup, which is full of sugar and salt, jam mixed with a bit of water. You then drop it onto the posterior third of the patient's tongue. Then raise the tongue upwards and backwards. This forms a natural channel between the tongue and the roof of the mouth, allowing this viscous gel-like food to go down straight into the patient's stomach. Your next objective would be to transfer the patient from this safe zone to a clinic where you can do some primary treatment. However, the patient has got a fractured jaw. This jaw is moving around, causing the patient pain and bleeding. However, you are not carrying any splints with you. So how can you make this comfortable during his transportation? The body has given you a splint. This splint is the intact upper jaw. If you can push your fractured lower jaw and hold it against an intact upper jaw, the upper jaw will then act as a splint. You can do that by using a simple buff, a simple face cover, which you can twist and make it into a bandage, or you can use a long cloth scarf or a head cover, any long piece of cloth and make a barrel bandage. Now, how do we make a barrel bandage? So we take our long tubular piece of cloth. The center part of this tubular piece of cloth goes below the chin. 
Now the trick is to spread it all the way from the front of your chin to the angle of the neck. You should cover as much of the lower border of the mandible as possible. Then pull on the cloth upwards. As you pull on the cloth upwards, it pulls the mandible or the lower jaw against the maxilla or the upper jaw. At the same time, ask the patient to take her hand and support the bandage against the lower jaw as well as at the same time push the lower jaw against the upper jaw. Now you got two tubular ends to this cloth. So one end here, one end here. Then take one end, let it go all the way to the top of the head towards the opposite ear and cross it, cross it just above the upper ear. Now this tie of this bandage here, the crossing of the tails here is your foundation knot. You must make sure that this knot doesn't slide up, down, front or back, just remains immediately above the ear. And now you've got two tail ends here. When you do that, tell the patient to support the barrel bandage against the lower jaw of the mandible and to the top of her head, holding the bandage in place. So now you have got one tail end here, one tail end here. Take the front tail end and that goes just above the eyebrows over the forehead. So just above the eyebrows over the forehead. The back end goes behind the occiput of the skull and then you cross it over the opposite ear. So that way you're using the maximum circumference of your head this way and maximum circumference of your head that way. When you cross it over the opposite ear, you then tie a knot over the opposite ear, tuck the tail ends in. So this is what your barrel bandage should look like. Let us summarize this with a video. You're taking the long tubular piece of cloth, goes below the chin, top of the head, and is then crossed over just above the ear. The front tail goes over the forehead, back tail goes behind the skull. You tie it over the opposite ear. And that is how you make a barrel bandage. Now this barrel bandage is excellent even for supporting bandages. So in the case of a rubber bullet injury or any high velocity injury where you got loss of tissue on your cheek causing bleeding, then in that case, the first thing what you got to do is to wash that area out. Rubber bullets are essentially have a metal core and are covered with a piece of rubber or plastic. Sometimes there are pieces of wood also as a part of the structure of a rubber bullet. And you must take some water and wash out all this debris because if it is left in the tissue, it will cause some infection. So once you washed this wound out, you then have to pack that area to reduce the bleeding. But the problem of the cheek is there is no bone as such to press against. In this case, what you do is a bi-manual packing. You take a large swab of gauze or some nice clean sterile cloth and put it in the place which is known as the buccal vestibule. That is the place between the cheek and the teeth. It is this area here. So you pack this gauze between the cheek and the teeth here. Then you open out the surface wound and then tightly pack the surface wound till you cannot pack any more gauze into the surface wound. Once you packed the surface wound, so this wound has been packed on the inside with the gauze into the structure of the wound with a gauze or cloth. Once you packed it bi-manually, 
Then he put some pressure on it for three full minutes. Then place another piece of gauze or cloth on top of that and then hold it in place by using a barrel bandage. Next, we have to transport this patient to a primary care center. Now we know when there is a fracture of the lower jaw, especially a bilateral fracture of the lower jaw, the bone itself is displaced backwards. As the bone gets displaced backwards, the tongue, which is attached here, is also displaced backwards and can obstruct the oropharynx. The patient has excessive bleeding coming from the fractured bony fragments. This excess blood and the blood clots could go behind and obstruct the airway in the oropharyngeal area. So therefore, we must make sure that we do not transfer the patient or transport the patient in a supine position because we would be then compromising the airway. Let us look at some examples where the transportation procedure is a bit worrying. So in this case, it is marginally worrying because the patient is in the supine position. However, he is well supervised and his head is supported. This patient is moderately risky because he is lying flat on the back on a modified stretcher. However, there are people around him to supervise him. So it is a risky position. But the riskiest is this position here. So he is lying flat on a back on a stretcher. It is a resource poor environment. No one is keeping an eye on him. Everyone is busy doing other things. So he may develop an airway compromise and no one would realize this. So therefore, he's unsupervised in a supine position with a facial injury and is at a high risk of airway compromise. So therefore, how do we transport a patient who's had a facial injury? The best position to transport a patient with a facial injury is the lateral trauma position or three-fourths prone position. In this position, because the patient is placed in such a way that we can combine our airway maintenance as well as spinal protection with this position. So, when you modify and use a crowd barrier as a stretcher or you modify and use a simple piece of plastic as a stretcher, as you transfer the patient, we advise that you put the patient in this lateral trauma position or lateral prone position in such a way that the injured side of the face faces upwards so you can supervise the patient as you transport the patient. So when we see the transportation here where the patient is being carried and there is no stretcher, the patient is still in a semi-prone position and he is supervised. So the patient is not lying flat on his back compromising his airway. What is the advice transportation from an individual who is hit in the face with a rubber bullet which has gone into or damaged his eye. Now the first thing to do when this happens is not to touch or rub the eye. Keep the patient in the upright position so the blood is pooled on the lower part of the eye. If possible, you can make a hard shield to cover the eye. You can take a disposable paper cup and cover and protect the eye to prevent any further damage. Or you can take a loose piece of cloth, clean sterile cloth and pack it gently around the eye. So it is important that you do not apply any pressure on the injured eye. Do not attempt to remove the foreign body at the site of injury. Let that be done in a primary or a secondary care center. 
you may require specialist attention for this. Now these patients with penetrating eye injuries will need antibiotics, both tropical and systemic. They are generally predisposed to gram-negative infection, so gentamicin is a good antibiotic to give these patients. Any delay of, the pre of this treatment would cause inflammation of the inside of the eye cavity. One must check the tetanus situation of these patients. And finally, they do require specialist attention. They may require total removal of the eye or removal of the contents of the eye. This is quite a major injury. Now the patient has reached your clinic. Once the patient reaches your clinic, that is a time to do a full secondary assessment and check for any possibility for specialist services and transportation of the same. So facial bones injury are always associated, very commonly associated with other injuries. So make sure that there is no loss in consciousness, no underlying head injuries, palpate the spine. Facial injuries can be treated later on but spinal and head injuries are critical to be treated as soon as possible. So in this presentation, we will be concentrating on primary isolated facial injuries. So the patient has come to your clinic. What is the position of the patient? It is important to note that the patient has suffered major injury and is predisposed to going into shock. So keep the patient warm. The patient is placed in the spine with his head propped up position. The patient would have swallowed a lot of blood. Blood is an emetic and blood may cause the patient to have a vomiting episode. So keep the patient closely supervised. Now, if you're by yourself, you will need retraction, illumination, to work in this patient's mouth. A good trick is to take a spoon or a spatula and tape your torch to it. So therefore, you have a way to retract and illuminate, both of them being provided when you're working in the mouth. So if you take a torch and tape it to a spoon or a spatula, it provides you retraction and illumination. What you do next depends on many factors. If it is a simple fracture and you're going to be transporting the patient to a secondary care setting, then you might put a simple wire around the fractured fragment and this is known as a bridal wire. And we will discuss this technique in detail later on. However, if you cannot transfer this patient and you have to deal with this facial fracture yourself, then you may have to wire the jaw together. And this is the eyelet jaw wiring, which we will be discussing in our next presentations. What else are you likely to see? You're likely to see a progressively increasing facial edema. When you tell the patient to open the mouth, Either the patient will be unable to open the mouth or the mouth will deviate to one particular side when the patient tries to open the mouth. When you put your fingers onto the jaw bone, on the lower jaw bone and try to move the bone up and down, you'll feel a sensation as if there are two pieces of sandpaper rubbing against each other. If you take your finger and put it along the lower border of the mandible, you might find a step-like deformity. However, if you do not have access to x-rays and if you need a test to check whether your suspicions of a fractured mandible are possible or not, a good test to help you reach your diagnosis is known as a tongue blade or tongue spatula test. So you take your normal wooden spatula, tell the patient to bite on the back teeth, onto the molar teeth right at the back. Give the other end of the spatula to the patient to hold. So the patient's holding the other end of the spatula 
and then tell the patient to try to twist and break it. If the patient gets a lot of pain and is unable to do that, then there is a possibility that there's a fracture mandible on this side. If the patient is able to do that on one side, then you repeat the test on the opposite side. You tell the patient again to bite on his back teeth, give the end of the spatula to the patient and tell the patient to try to twist and break it. Let us summarize this with a video. You can see that the patient is taking this wooden spatula, biting all the way back on the back molar teeth and is trying to twist and break it. If the patient is able to do it on that side, then you repeat this on the opposite side. Next, what else are you likely to see? You might find that the entire jawbone has collapsed or it is such the fracture of mandible has fractured in such a way that the patient is gagging or biting on his back teeth. Now, because of the fracture, the back teeth are meeting first and that is why the patient is unable to close his front teeth. So he has a bilateral anterior open bite. He could have a unilateral open bite. He could have the classical step deformity of a fractured mandible. He may have, he may have a fracture where the teeth and the bone holding the teeth or the bone supporting the teeth are broken, which is known as a dentoalveolar fracture. Or you may have a situation where the bone holding the teeth is fractured as well as the jaw is fractured. There may be major soft tissue injuries without a fracture of the lower jaw. Or you could have a situation where, as I explained previously, it so happens that the lower jaw fits into the upper jaw. That is a concept of your barrel bandage when you pull the lower jaw and hold it against the upper jaw. So the lower jaw fits into the upper jaw. However, because of the fracture, the lower jaw has escaped outside the confines of the upper jaw. So it has crossed outside the confines of the upper jaw and this is known as a unilateral cross bite. So here is what it should actually look like. But now because it's fractured, the lower jaw has crossed outside the confines of the upper jaw, giving rise to a unilateral cross bite. You could have a situation where there is a large and unilateral open bite. You could have multiple fractured fragments or you could have a solitary fractured fragment which is preventing the patient from closing the mouth or you could have nothing. So it all depends on the fracture line and the direction of the muscle pull. It could be such that it is so favorable that you cannot see anything or you cannot feel anything with regards to the heart tissues. In this case, you have to rely on soft tissue signs. So if you see a lot of bruising along the floor of the mouth, there's a pretty high chance that a fracture mandible exists. Another thing is you can check whether there is any numbness to the lower lip. If there is no sensation on the lower lip, that means the nerve is bruised and that is why he cannot feel you touching the lower lip. Why does that happen? The inferior alveolar nerve goes through or the mandibular nerve, which is the same thing, goes through this bone and then comes out from this little hole here and supplies the lower lip. So therefore, if you have a fracture in the mandible here, this nerve gets bruised or cut. Therefore, the nerve sensation does not go through the mental nerve and the whole lower lip feels numb. So why should you stabilize a jaw fracture? You should stabilize a jaw fracture because it will increase the patient's comfort. When you put the two bony fragments together, there will be immediately reduction in bleeding. 
by preventing these bony fragments moving up and down, rubbing against each other, it will decrease tissue damage and also it will protect the patient's airway. It will protect the patient's airway by preventing the displacement of the fractured jaw bone as well as by preventing the movement of the bone it will decrease the edema and hence it will protect the airway. It will make the transportation of the patient so much more simpler. So we learned how to do a barrel bandage and now we will discuss how to tie a simple bridal wire and how to put an IV loop or how to do jaw wiring. So let us first discuss bridal wire. So here you are in your clinic, the patient has been brought to you, you clean the patient's mouth and this is what you see. You see that the jaw has fractured and you see the crack between the front teeth. Now let us remove all the soft tissues and see what the bone actually looks like. So here we see it is not a clean fracture, it is a zigzag broken fracture with broken pieces of bone in between the fracture line. Let us look at the jaw on the inside. So we remove all the side stuff in and concentrate on the lower jaw on the tongue surface. And you see that there is a loose piece of bone here and the crack goes in different directions. Now, why is this so important? Because this explains why when sometimes you try to put the jaw together, it does not click together perfectly. That is because the zigzag fracture lines are interfering in the jaw coming together in a perfect way. In this case, you might have to move the jaw back and forth to get the correct alignment, but you can do your best. That is all you can do because sometimes Without an open reduction, it is possible that you may not get a perfect alignment. So you just have to do your best because that is all what you can do. So how do we tie a bridal wire? So we take along a piece of wire and we push this wire from the cheek side to the tongue side, two teeth away from the fracture line. So this is your fracture line two teeth away from the fracture line, we push it from the cheek to the tongue. Then we grasp it from the tongue, two teeth away from the fracture line, we push it from the tongue to the cheek and then tighten it on the cheek surface. Why two teeth? Now, if this is your fracture line, we know that the front teeth, front teeth have got conical roots, one root which is like a cone. Now the fracture is here, there is no bone support in here and these teeth have got conical roots. So if I take my wire, one tooth away from the fracture line, push it from the cheek side to the tongue side, then tongue side back to the cheek side and tie it up here. As I tighten it, because that there is no bone support here, these teeth could just be pop lifted up, right? So that is why it's two teeth away from the fracture line. Why not three? Why not four teeth away from the fracture line? Because if you do three or four teeth away from the fracture line and it's going to come here, there'll be a tenting effect here and you will not get sufficient rigid fixation. Now what if you cannot get hold of 24 or 26 gauge good stainless steel wire? In this case, you have to adapt and compromise. This will definitely affect your result. But again, you can only do your best. So you can use normal electrical wire. You can use the florist's wire. The wires with the florist used to arrange the flowers while selling them. However, these wires have a high tendency of rusting and they are quite brittle. You can use zip ties, but they are quite fiddly to use. 
But those are the options when you cannot get hold of a 24 or a 26 gauge stainless steel wire. Okay, so you got your wire. Now the first thing to do is to stretch your wire. So you take two pliers, grasp the ends of the wire, and then you stretch the wire. You stretch the wire till you feel a give sensation. They say you should stretch it to up to 10%. How do you know? You just feel a little stretching sensation. That's all you need to feel. Once you stretched your wire, you then need to cut these bent ends of the wire. Remember where you held it with a plier? These ends are bent. We need to cut these bent ends off. So why should you stretch the wire? Once you stretch the wire, it's easier to use the wire. It removes the internal stresses from the wire and also within 24 to 48 hours, this wire tends to shrink. So it'll further help in the rigidity of your fixation. And that is why you should stretch your wire. So once you stretched your wire and cut the crimped or bent ends of the wire, then you're ready to do your bridal wire fixation. Before you do that, it is important to note quite a few of our patients have very poor oral hygiene. That results in all this food and debris collecting between the teeth. Because there's food and debris collecting between the teeth, then you will not be able to pass your wire between the teeth because this food will obstruct, this very hard deposit of food will obstruct your wire from going through. So you can take any sharp needle, a nice big round needle, and push it between the teeth, getting rid of all this debris between the teeth, making a passageway for your wire to go between the teeth. Yeah. Then you take your wire and you push your wire from the cheek to the tongue. You see these black arrows and the red arrows, you're pushing the wire from the cheek side of the teeth to the tongue side of the teeth. What can you do to retract or move away the lips and the cheeks while you're doing this very fiddly procedure? You can just use a bent spoon, which is excellent as a retractor to move the lips and the cheeks away when you're doing a jaw wiring or any procedure in your mouth. It is an excellent retractor. Right, so you pass the wire from the cheek to the tongue side, then you grasp it from the tongue side. To, this is your fracture line. So two teeth away, remember two teeth away from the fracture line, you pass it from the tongue back to the cheek side. Then you take your pliers and cross the wires and grasp the cross wires on the cheek side. You turn your plier three to four times in the clockwise direction. So you're twisting the wires three to four times in the clockwise direction. The wire is still loose. It's not tightened yet. You turn it three to four times. Then just cut these tail ends of the wire out. So you're left with a manageable twisted end of the wire. It makes things so much easier. And then you do the final wiring. Once you do the final tightening, twist the ends of the wire towards the teeth and gums. Make sure they are not sticking outside onto the lip. So twist them towards the teeth and the gums. Now, if you have to take out this wire, how do we take out this wire? We loosen this wire a couple of times so that it is loose and then we cut one end of the wire, grasp it with our pliers and then just pull it out towards the lip side. So that is how you take a bridal wire out. Let us summarize this with a video so you can get a clearer picture of what I'm talking about. So we cross the wire on the cheek side. 
you can see my finger supporting the tongue end of the wire on the wire on the tongue end is supported by my finger holding it in place and flushing it close to the teeth I turned it three to four times so this wire is still loose it is not tight and now I'm going to cut this wire the wrong way to cut this wire is like this now what could happen is this loose end of the wire could flick into my eye or be lost in the patient's mouth the correct way to do it is to grasp the end of the wire with a plier so it's safely located and then cut the wire so we cannot lose the wire and also it will not flick into my eye so now we got the twisted end of the wire finally I'm doing the final twist and the final tightening and when I do that I turn the end of the wire towards the teeth and gum so it's not sticking into the patient's lips let us now discuss how to wire the jaws together using eyelet wiring. So for eyelet wiring, we make these eyelets. These eyelets are known as IV loops and they have a round bit, a short twisty bit and two long tails. This is what they look like in real life, a round bit a short twisty bit and two long tails. How many of these do we make? We make eight IV loops. So we make four for the upper jaw and four for the lower jaw. In the upper jaw, we attach these IV loops, the first one on the right side molar area, the second one on the upper right side premolar area, the third one on the upper left premolar area and the fourth one on the upper left molar area. Similarly, we attach four <clears throat> on the lower jaw. We attach one between the lower right molar area, lower right premolar area, lower left premolar area and lower left molar area. So we attach four to the top jaw, four to the bottom jaw. Next, we need four bridging wires. So the four bridging wires are essentially straight wires. These wires are used to connect the bottom eyelet to the top eyelet. So you pass it through the bottom loop, eyelet and loop is the same thing, then pass it through the top loop, you twist it, so you need four of them. One connecting the loops or eyelets in the molar area, one collecting the loops or eyelets in the premolar area on the right side, then one connecting the loops or the eyelets on the left side premolar area and finally on the molar on the left side. How do we attach these IV loops to the teeth? So as you know, these loops have got two long tails. So we push both the tails from the cheek side to the roof side. Then we take the front tail goes from the inside back outside, the back tail goes from inside back outside, but the back tail goes through this loop and is then tied to the front tail. So the back tail goes through the loop and is tied to the front tail. We will discuss that in greater detail now. So first we have to make an IV loop. How do we make an IV loop? We take our straight piece of wire around 15 centimeters, so about from your finger to your wrist, that length of wire, from your finger to your wrist, around 15 centimeters of wire. We stretch it so it's nice and stretched. Then we take a nail. We place the nail in the center, in the center of the wire. Then we cross the wire over the nail we grasp our pliers which is crossed very close to the nail and then we twist it three to four times. So we get a round loop, a short twisty bit and two long tails. Then we got to attach it to the teeth. So you see this red arrow, we pass both the wires from the cheek side to the tongue side. So both the wires are passed from outside to inside, from the cheek side to the tongue side along this red arrow. 
then the back wire goes around this tooth on the tongue side and comes out back on the cheek side. The front wire goes around this tooth from the back, from the front and comes again to the outside. Now that is why we need a short twisty bit because this twisty segment should fit between these two teeth. If it is very long, this twisty area or wire, this loop will extend too far towards the cheek side. So we need a short one. So this loop comes quite close to the teeth. How do we manage this? We do this as I suggested by crossing your pliers as close to the nail as possible. So if you cross your wire close to the nail and then turn it three to four times, you get a short twisty bit. If you cross it too far away from the nail somewhere here and then turn it around, you will land up with a long twisty bit. So that is why you must hold your plier close to the nail and turn it three to four times to get a short twisty bit. Okay. Now you see this back wire, this back wire we pass through the loop and then we tie it to the front wire. So the back wire goes through the loop and is tied to the front wire. And when you twist it with the front wire, we go in the clockwise direction. Everything, all our twisting action is done in a clockwise direction. So let us summarize this. So if this is your loop and this is that short twisted wire, these are the other two long tails. The red is the back one, the blue is the front one. What we should not do is our front tail, which has gone around this tooth and come back onto the cheek side, you should not pass it through the loop. So do not pass the front wire backwards through the loop. Do not do that. What you should not do is to pass the front wire through the loop going back and the back wire going through the loop coming in front crossing in the loop. Do not do that. Do not take the back wire over the loop and tie it with the front wire. Do not do that. What you should do is that the back wire goes through the loop and is then tied or twisted with the front wire. Okay. So once you've done that, so we can see here, the back wire is going through the loop and is then twisted with the front wire. Once you've done that, turn it three to four times, so it is still not tight, then trim it down. It makes the whole thing so much easier. Just trim the excess wire down, so you're left with a relatively short twisty bit. Then you do the final tightening and turn the end of the twisted wire towards the teeth and the gums, so it's not sticking into the cheek. If, once you've done that, if you want to take out the IV loops, how do we do that? We loosen it and then you see that wire which is going through this loop. As it is going through this loop, we cut that wire off. So that this wire is no longer going through the loop. So there is a loop and there is no wire going through the loop and we cut this entire twisted section off. So we cut the front tail here and the back tail here. So there is no wire going through the loop and then we grasp hold of it and pull it out towards the cheek side. Now that we've attached the wire, we've attached four of these loops to the top jaw, four of the loops to the bottom jaw. Now we have to do a bridging wire. So you've got to connect the bottom loop to the top loop. How do we do that? We take our straight wire and we go, see he is going from front to back. So we take our straight wire and that goes through the bottom loop from front to back like that. And then we turn this around and then it goes through the top loop from back to front, it's going around like that. And then we've got to twist it together. This is another technique of twisting the wire, especially when you're using a brittle wire. So we've seen our wire, 
which has gone through through a bottom loop, gone around, then through a top loop, and then you cross it at 90 degrees, holding it with two different pliers. So we crossed it, and then we just twist it one over the other. That way you're symmetrically twisting the wire. So we are going clockwise, and we are twisting the wire one over the other. Twist, 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 and then we trim the excess of the wire off, so it's still loose, it's not tight, we're just trimming the excess of the wire off, and then we finally tighten it and twist it finally to get our nice rigid jaw wiring fixation. Okay, so let us summarize this with a video. So we've taken a long straight piece of wire, we bent it in half, we put a nail in the center, we grasp it with an artery forcep close to the nail, we turn it three to four times, three to four times we are turning it. So we then get a small round, short twisty bit, two long tails. So that is your IV loop. Now we are attaching it to the teeth. So we push both the wires from outside to inside. Then we are taking the back wire, which is going from inside back outside. Then we are taking the front wire, which is going from inside back outside. It'll come out from here. Okay, so the front wire is coming out from here. So front and back. Now this wire will go through the loop and be twisted with the back wire here. So it's going through the loop and is then being twisted with this wire here. You see that? It goes through the loop and we twist it with this wire here. And when we twist it, we grasp it with our pliers and turn it a few times so it's still not fully tight. And now we will trim the ends of this wire off and then we will do the final tightening, twisting this end of the wire towards the teeth and the gums. So we're twisting it in, okay? Now, if it breaks, something happens to it and we got to take it out. How do we take it out? We loosen it and then we cut this entire twisted end off. So you see this wire which is going through the loop and is twisted with the front wire? We cut that off. We cut the front wire off here, so the entire twisted bit is removed. Then we pull this wire out from this IV loop. So we are pulling this wire out, so there's nothing in this IV loop anymore, grasping the IV loop and pulling it out towards the lip side. Now this is a bridging wire, so we're passing the straight wire through the bottom loop from front to back, and then we're turning it around passing it through the top loop from back to front. So it's gone through the bottom loop, through the top loop. Then I'll grasp it with my pliers or artery forceps. And then what we do is put a bit of traction. So allowing the jaw to come back, come together, getting a good bite. And then we cross it at 90 degrees and twist one over the other. There's no need for this to be uh, perfect or neat. It is just the initial bit. You just have to start it off. Then we trim it down. We trim it down. So now you got a wire which is very loose, which is connecting the top loop to the bottom loop. We then grasp it with our pliers or artery forceps and we turn it with a bit of traction, not in the anti-clockwise, but in the clockwise direction. We always do in the clockwise direction. We turn it in the clockwise direction, we trim it down to a manageable length, and we again do the final turns and tuck the ends in towards the teeth and the gums so it is not poking into the cheek. Okay, like that. So that we got to do four times to connect the four top ones with the four bottom ones. Now let's say you wired the bottom jaw to the top jaw. The patient starts having difficulty in breathing and you want to open the wires up and open his mouth up to see what's happening. All you have to do is to cut the bridging wire. So that is all you cut. You do not take out the IV loops. Let the IV loops remain. You just cut the bridging wire. Once you've examined, you can again put the bridging wire back on. So you cut the bridging wire. So how do we cut the bridging wire? You see, this is the top IV loop and the bottom IV loop. So this is the bridging wire we have to cut. 
So we hold it with our pliers, the bridging wire, and then once we cut the bridging wire, we pull the bridging wire out. This allows you to open the mouth without any problems, check what is happening, and then you can simply rewire the jaw again without any issues. So what did we achieve? We restored the bite, reduced the bite, stabilized the bite. What did we learn? Always pre-stretch the wires before doing your jaw wiring. Always twist your wires in a clockwise direction. Why? Because if the patient goes somewhere else and that medic wants to tighten the wire, the medic will tighten the wire in the clockwise direction. If you have tightened the wire in the anti-clockwise direction, then he will be doing the reverse of what he thinks he is doing. So always tighten the wires in the clockwise, loosen the wire anti-clockwise. When you tighten the wires, we lightly tighten or loosely tighten the wires first, then we trim the ends down and then we do the final tightening. We make sure that the cut ends of the wires are not poking into the lips, into the cheeks. We turn them in towards the teeth and the gums. How do we look after this patient? Now this patient care, I divided it into the first 72 hours and after 72 hours. So in the first 72 hours, the patient should be in a resting position and avoid any major physical activity. Close all the lacerations within 12 hours. In the first 24 hours, avoid any major rinsing. After that, after the first 24 hours, you can allow the patient to gently rinse with a half a teaspoon of salt in lukewarm water. How do we feed this patient? If you do not have access to IV fluids or nasogastric feeds, what you can do is take a spoon and initially it's liquid or transparent, very thin fluids for the first 72 hours and you use the space behind your last molar teeth. So this space is known as a distobuckle gutter. So it is behind your last molar teeth and in front of the vertical part of the mandible. So in this triangular space here, which is here all the way back, you can use a syringe to drop fluids in or a small teaspoon to put food down there and the patient will be able to swallow the fluid and the food. What about medication? The patient will need antibiotics and will need analgesics. These can be dissolved and let the patient swallow it. You may, if you have access to PR route, to give some painkillers, but just normal ibuprofen, amoxicillin, metronidazole, that group of antibiotics will greatly help in recovery and prevent post-fracture infections. What do you have to be cautious about? We try to tell the patient not to blow their nose because if the upper jaw has a crack or a fracture running through it, which you have not detected, if they blow their nose, the air will go through the sinuses straight into the facial spaces and the patient will get a major swelling. So we tell the patients, do not blow your nose. The patient may have swallowed a lot of blood and may be predisposed to vomiting. So if the patient feels like vomiting, just reassure the patient, put the patient's head down and let the patient vomit through his wired jaw. You can settle the stomach using Coke or 7-Up. What happens after 72 hours? After 72 hours, if the patient is able to encourage a bit of mobility, then the patient's oral health must be maintained. So after every meal, the patient must make sure that they gently brush the teeth and clean the teeth and rinse. You may use your bent spoon as a retractor 
for allowing the patient to brush, clean and maintain their oral hygiene. How do we feed the patient? We feed the patient in six to eight small meals a day, preferably liquid and gradually we go to thicker and thicker fluids. You may think about using double strength milk. Double strength milk is milk powder mixed with milk and can give quite a bit of nourishment to the patient. What do we have to be cautious about? The wire cutter should be accessible in case we have to cut the wires and open the patient's mouth. Because of the change in diet, the patient may be predisposed to constipation or diarrhea. Next, let us discuss dentoalveolar fractures. Dentoalveolar fractures are those fractures where there's a fracture of the teeth and the surrounding bone without the fracture of the jaw. So the teeth with the supporting bone is fractured, but the jaw is still not fractured. So imagine a baton charge has taken place, resulting in a frontal assault. This has caused a dentoalveolar fracture, that is the fracture of the teeth and the supporting bone. So what has happened is, in this demonstration, as the baton has hit the patient's tooth, this has pushed, this has pushed the tooth back. As the tooth is pushed back towards the roof of the mouth, so this is the lip side and that is the roof of the mouth or the tongue side. As the patient got hit and the tooth was pushed towards the tongue or the roof of the mouth, the root goes in the opposite direction to the front, that is to the lip or the cheek side of the mouth. As the root moves towards the front, it jumps over this broken edge of bone and gets locked in front of this broken edge of bone and cannot go back to its normal place. So therefore, the same thing can happen with the back teeth. In the case of a blunt injury, like a blunt plastic bullet injury, it can go towards the back through the cheek and cause a large dentoalveolar fracture with or in connection with the posterior teeth. So how do we treat this dentoalveolar fracture? This dentoalveolar fracture first has to be reduced. How do we reduce it? Now what has happened is that as we said that the tooth has gone backwards and the root has come in front and is locked in front of this edge of fractured bone. So the first direction is we have to lift this tooth up. So if this triangle is your root apex, it was here. When we lift this tooth up, the root apex goes above the edge of the fractured bone. So that is your first direction. Your next direction is you have to then push the tooth. As you push the tooth, the root apex goes from the front of this edge of bone to behind this edge of bone, behind the fractured edge of bone. Yeah, And then you release this tooth. As you release this tooth, the root apex then goes behind the fractured edge of the bone. Occasionally, you might have to use a pressure from inside or the tongue side on the tooth by pushing outwards and upwards to disimpact this tooth from the fractured edge of the bone and then may need a downward force to push it behind this fractured edge of the bone. So you might need some other movements to disimpact the apex of the root so that the tooth can go back into its original location. So we can see here that this tooth has got fractured and the fractured tooth has been pushed towards the roof side, preventing the patient from closing the mouth and interfering in the patient's bite. So you sandwich this with a gauze, finger inside, outside, manipulate the tooth in the correct position, i.e. the tooth and bone in the correct position so that it is in alignment so it is no more interfering in the patient's bite. Now once you've done that, you have to fix this dentoalveolar fracture. How do we do that? 
the first thing to do is to tell the patient to bite on a large piece of gauze. So the pink marks the area where the dental alveolar fracture has taken place. As the patient bites for four to eight minutes on a large piece of gauze, this allows a blood clot to form. This makes the oral environment so much more easier to work in. So after the blood clot has formed, there is the salivation in the mouth decreases, the mouth gets drier, the less blood in the mouth, and it's easier to work, easier to put the splint, and easier to fix the splint. So what do we use as a splint? Any sort of a wire-shaped structure can be used as a splint. This might be a piece of wire, a nasal clip of a face mask, or a straightened safety pin or a paper clip. How long should your splint be? So the pink marks the area where there is a dental alveolar fracture. So the length of the splint should be longer, one to two teeth longer on either side of the fractured fragment. So it should stretch from one to two teeth on this side and one to two teeth on the opposite side. What do we do with the ends of the splint? The ends of the splint, we bend them a bit. By bending them a bit, it allows a splint to be tucked between the adjacent teeth. What is the location of the splint? The location of the splint is midway from the gum margin to the top surface of the tooth. So it's in the mid point of the teeth. So it's midway between the gum margin and the top surface of the teeth. The ends of the splint, you try to push it between the adjacent teeth. So it gets tucked between the adjacent teeth. How do we hold or attach the splint to the teeth? Now from your dentist, you can get adhesive dental materials. And these are the glass inomer materials which chemically stick to the teeth like super glue or the composite materials, some of which get hard by themselves and some which require a light to make them hard. These will be available with your dentist. However, if you do not have access to these materials, there are other materials which have been used. These materials which have been used are the denture acrylics, that is the pink material from which the denture is made from, super glue and household adhesives. Now there is a warning with these materials. These materials are not meant to be used inside the mouth. If you use it inside the mouth, they give off really harmful irritating chemicals. They also generate a lot of heat when they are setting and both of these will cause damage to the surrounding teeth, gums and bone. So they can be quite harmful when used inside the mouth but they have been used in the past. They also act as a food trap by the way they are constructed and placed. Now how do we attach the splint to the teeth? First we tell the patients to bite. When the patient bites, it makes sure that the fractured fragment will remain in its correct position and the patient's bite will remain normal because as the patient bites, the lower teeth will actually support the fractured fragment to a certain extent. Then when the splint is put, we first put the adhesives on the teeth besides the fractured fragment. So we put it on the right side first and then on the left side. We do not initially put it on the fractured fragment. So we put the adhesives on all the teeth except the ones which are included as a part of the fractured fragment. So we put it on the right side, we put it on the left side and then finally we put it on the teeth which are attached to the fractured fragment. That way holding the splint onto the teeth. The splint 
can then be removed after four to five weeks. What is the role of jaw wiring in the management of dentoalveolar fractures? When there is a major or a large dentoalveolar fracture, you might have to wire the jaws together. So imagine a blunt injury which has resulted in a major posterior dentoalveolar fracture. What you can then do is wire the normal side first and then wire the fractured side. Next, we will be discussing upper jaw fractures, examination and diagnosis. Upper jaw fractures were classified by this guy called Leafwort in Leafwort 1, 2 and 3. It is a useful classification which allows you to examine the patient in a more systematic way and communicate to the others what your findings are. So first, let us discuss Leafwort 1 fracture. Leafwort 1 fracture is also known as a lower mid-face fracture. So in this fracture, only the teeth and the hard palate or the roof of the mouth moves. So it's essentially a floating palate which we are talking about. How do we examine this patient? So for this patient, we take our non-dominant hand. So I am right-handed. So my left hand is my non-dominant hand. This non-dominant hand or my, or my left hand is used to support the patient's face. The dominant hand goes in the patient's mouth and there is two grips which you can use. First is the anterior grip where by using your thumb and index finger, you hold the upper jaw and it is held in the bone above the upper anterior teeth. So the bone above the upper anterior teeth. The other grip which you can use is the posterior grip where your thumb and index finger grips the upper jaw on the bone above your upper posterior teeth. And then you try to move your jaw forwards and backwards and side to side and check for any movement. Leafwort 2 fractures. In the case of a leafwort 2 fracture, which is also known as a central mid-face fractures, in this, the patients, the teeth, the hard palate and the nose moves, but the area around the eye does not move. How do we examine these patients? In this case, your non-dominant hand, so my left hand, actually checks for movement. It checks for movement in two locations. So it checks for movement in the nasoethmoid area and it checks for movement in the inferior orbital margin area, like so. Your dominant hand goes inside the patient's mouth on the bone above your molar teeth and tries to move the jaw forward, backwards, side to side, where your dominant, non-dominant hand, your non-dominant hand is checking for movement in the nasoethmoid area and in the inferior orbital margin area. In a leaf for three fractures, the entire face moves. This is known as a full mid-face fracture. So essentially, we are talking of a floating face. In this case, your non-dominant hand again is checking for movement. It's checking for movement in two areas. It's checking for movement in the frontozygomatic area like here and here. And it's checking your movement in the higher nasoethmoid area like here. Your dominant hand is going inside the mouth on the bone above the molar teeth and is trying to move your jaw forwards, forwards and backwards and side to side. Whereas your non-dominant hand is checking for movements in these locations. But you can appreciate that in, a cent in your upper jaw fractures, because of all the trauma, the swelling and the bleeding, it is quite difficult to actually feel any movement. 
So therefore, you are relying on soft tissues, signs and symptoms to point you into the direction, to guide you in the direction where the bone is fractured. So therefore, if we see circumorbital ecchymosis or if we see a subconjunctival hemorrhage where you cannot see the posterior boundary of the hemorrhage, that should increase your suspicion that there is a fracture maxilla which has taken place. The other important signs are bruising behind the ear. Now, this is known as the batter sign. Why does this take place? When the lower jaw is hit, the lower jaw gets pushed back. As the lower jaw gets pushed back, as it goes back, this part of the lower jaw, which is known as the condyle, gets pushed back. As it is pushed back, it cracks the middle cranial fossa on the back here as it is going backwards. And when it cracks it, there is a crack in the base of the skull, in the middle cranial fossa, and this causes bruising to take place behind the ear, which is quite serious. If you look into the ear, there is blood coming out of the ear, there may be CFS, CSF fluid coming out of the ear, and if you look inside the mouth, there may be a palatal laceration inside the mouth. So let us just see this with a video. When we see this, it, this is the lip, that's the chin. Patient has been hit on the chin. As the patient is hit on the chin, this lower jaw gets pushed backwards. As the lower jaw gets pushed backward, the condyle in the lower jaw gets pushed backward and cracks the middle cranial fossa. This causes bleeding in the ear. And when you put your finger in front of the ear and try to palpate it, there will be tenderness in that side. When we look behind the ear, there will be bruising behind the ear, indicating that there is a battle sign. When we look in the ear after it's cleaned, we will notice that there is blood encrustation inside the ear. In our next session, we will discuss how facial trauma causes an airway obstruction. Now, this airway obstruction may be partial or complete. What actually causes it? Multiple factors in facial injuries can cause airway obstruction. And this may be just edema in the peripharyngeal area, or it could be foreign bodies like teeth, broken bits of denture, which could cause an airway obstruction. It could be blood clots, which could cause an airway obstruction, or it could be the physical displacement of the top jaw, physical displacement of the bottom jaw, which could close the nasopharynx, which will close the oropharynx and cause an airway obstruction. So how do we treat it or manage it? To tackle the airway obstruction, you can have the semi-definitive airway strategy or the definitive airway strategy. We will be essentially be concentrating on the semi-definitive airway strategy to establish the patient's airway. That is, by using whatever materials accessible with you to try to support the patient's airway. In this case, patient's position is important. Normally, head tilt chin lift is a good position to establish the airway. But in the case of facial injuries, as for this particular patient, he was more comfortable sitting up with his head slightly bent down or tilted to one side. Clearing of the blood clots and mucus from the mouth and the nose if you have access to suction. Otherwise, by using a controlled finger sweep, controlled visible finger sweep, where you can see exactly what, where the debris is and clearing all that debris out, making sure that no debris is pushed down through the airway because that might land up in the right bronchus. If you have access to the airways, then you may want to use airways in these situations. Now, why does the upper jaw fracture cause airway obstruction? What happens is that when your upper jaw is fractured, like so, the fractured fragments slides along the base of the skull and it slides 
backwards and downwards along the base of the skull. As it slides backwards and downwards, it then obstructs the nasopharyngeal area, thus compromising the airway. As the maxillary fracture or upper jaw fracture is pushed downwards and backwards, it creates a long face or a long dish-faced appearance. Also, when you look at the patient, you think the patient is keeping his or her mouth open. But actually, what has happened is because this jaw has been pushed downwards and backwards, it is gagging onto the posterior teeth, creating an anterior open bite, making a false appearance of an open mouth. How do we treat it? We have to grasp this upper jaw or maxillary fragment and pull it upwards and outwards. How do we do that? With our non-dominant hand, that is my left hand, we support the patient's head. The dominant hand, you can use two different grips. Your index fingers can go behind the soft palate and pull the upper jaw upwards and outwards. The other grip is you take your thumb and index finger and it goes and holds the maxilla like so and pulls it upwards and outwards. So you put your thumb and index finger on the bone above your molar teeth, grasp the upper jaw and pull the upper jaw upwards and outwards, opening this airway up and treating the patient's airway. Lower jaw fractures can cause airway obstruction. How does that happen? When you have a fracture in the front of the mandible, like so. So this area is known as symphysis. So if you have a fracture on both the sides of it, it is a highly unfavorable fracture. And what happens is it then gets displaced and goes backwards and downwards. As it goes backwards and downwards, the tongue which is attached to the back of this piece of bone also goes backwards and downwards. That obstructs the patient's oropharynx, compromising the airway. So what can you do? You can grasp this fro fractured piece of bone or the mandible and pull it upwards and outwards. Once you've done that, as you pull it upwards and outwards, it brings the attachment of the tongue upwards and outwards thereby opening the airway. So anterior and forward manual stabilization. And once you brought it upwards and outwards, you can then wire it, put a small bridal wire around the teeth to hold it in its forwards position. The other semi-definite strategy to treat the patient's airway is to control catastrophic nasal bleeding. Patients with mid-face fractures are exposed to major epistaxis. That is because most of the fractures of the mid-face goes through the nose. There are a lot of controversies and challenges dealing with this subject, which is explained really nicely in this particular article. That is because normal first aid measures will not work in these patients. What will work is nasal packing. Now the next video is extremely graphic. The reason why this video is included is to show that you can have a major facial injury as an isolated facial injury without any injury to the other parts of the body. And in these major facial injuries, we still have to follow the protocol of A, B, C, D, E. But to maintain the airway, we have to control the bleeding. And for these patients, the only way where we can control the bleeding is by nasal packing. So if you do not want to see this video, I will tell you when it's over and then you can again start watching. So the video will start now. It is a graphic video. So this shows that there is a major facial injury involving the soft and hard tissues. The patient will his bleeding will increase over a period and you have to control the bleeding. And the best way to control this bleeding will be 
by a posterior and an anterior nasal pack. So briefly, we will describe it in detail. How do we do a posterior nasal pack? We take any catheter or a plastic tubing, a suction cannula, flexible. We pass it along the floor of the nose and bring it out into the mouth. Then we tie the posterior nasal pack to the end of the catheter which has come out through the mouth. Then we pull the catheter up back up through the nose. As we pull it up through the nose, we guide the post nasal pack in the post nasal space. In places where resources are limited, you may be able to make your own posterior and anterior nasal pack. And all you need is some gauze, a big section of gauze and some ribbon gauzes or gauzes in a thread like form. And you make your own posterior nasal pack and anterior nasal pack. How do we do that? We take a piece of gauze, we take a ribbon gauze and tie it across this block of gauze. So now you have one piece of gauze, which is your posterior nasal pack and two tail ends. Then you take another ribbon gauze and tie it again to the nasal, to the gauze or post nasal pack. So now you have your gauze with a pair of tail ends. These will go through the nose and a single tail end which will come out through the mouth. So this is a post nasal pack with three ties, two here and one here. If you want further reinforcements, you can just stitch this whole thing together to hold it nice and tightly. Now, how do we place a posterior nasal pack? We take our nasal catheter, we slide it along the floor of the nose. As we slide it along the floor of the nose, it comes out through the mouth. Now, the good way of opening the mouth is known as a cross fingered grip. So we take our thumb and index finger. We place it between our upper and lower teeth right at the back and then we cross it. So the thumb exerts a force upwards, index finger exerts a force downwards, opening the mouth. When we open the mouth, we see that the plastic catheter has come out through the mouth. We grasp it with our artery forceps and bring it out through the mouth. Then we take our post nasal pack and we tie, you know, the pair of ribbon gauzes, which I said goes through the nose. We tie the ends of that to the catheter, which has come out through the mouth. So this, you can see the catheter has gone through the nose and come out through the mouth. The ends of this ribbon gauze, we tie to that part of the catheter, which has come out through the mouth. So we tie it through that like so. Let us just see with this small video. Now these rings are here because it is a reusable catheter used on a workshop. Normally you just have a normal catheter with a slight side hole. So you're taking a ribbon gauze and tying the ends of these pair of ribbon gauzes, just the ends to the catheter which has come out through the mouth. Okay. So just the end. So this is your post nasal pack. This is a single ribbon gauze and this is your double or tail end ribbon gauzes. The pair of ribbon gauzes are here. Okay. So that is it. So now I'm pulling the catheter out through the nose. This feeds it in through the mouth. It goes in through the mouth, takes the ribbon gauzes with it. And they come out through the nose, guiding the post nasal pack into the post nasal space. So thereby you tuck it into the post nasal space. Right? So here we go. We are pulling our nasal catheter out through the nose. As we pull it out through the nose, the pair of ribbon gauzes are pulled in through the mouth. Your catheter comes out through the nose. And this is your pair of ribbon gauzes coming out through the nose. And this is the post nasal pack. The post nasal pack goes back, back and is tucked with your index finger into the post nasal space here. And then you untie your, your plastic catheter 
and then tie all the ribbon gauzes together. So we, you've established a good solid post nasal pack. Now against, this is where your post nasal pack is. Now against this post nasal pack, this is where the post nasal pack is. And against this post nasal pack, we are going to place an anterior nasal pack. <clears throat> so you take your ribbon gauze, grasp it with your artery force at just the end and drop it all the way back onto your nasal floor. And then grasp another end, pop it all the way back. So you are like folding it into the anterior nasal space. And that way you have a post nasal pack and an anterior nasal pack, totally packing the nose and thereby reducing the bleeding. So let us see that. Nasal catheter going through the nose, coming out through the mouth. So nose coming out through the mouth and this end I will tie the two tail ends of my post nasal pack. So post nasal pack, single tail end, two tail ends. I'm tying it to the end of the catheter which has come out through the mouth. Tying it so right at the end of it, okay, keeping this much laxity. And I'm pulling it out through the nose. As I pull it out through the nose, I guide the post nasal pack and with my index finger, I guide it into the post nasal space. Pull the nasal catheter out. As the nasal catheter comes out, it takes the ribbon gauzes with it. So this is the post nasal pack in place. And now I'm going to take the anterior nasal pack, slide it along, drop it all the way back onto the nasal floor and then fold it gently in place, totally packing the anterior nasal space. Thereby I've got a post nasal pack and an anterior nasal pack, totally packing the entire section of the nose and thereby controlling my bleeding from a mid face fracture. You fold it in slowly and steadily and block the anterior nasal space. You may, if you have access to a urinary catheter, like a Follies catheter, use a Follies catheter, 10 to 12 or French 14, as your post nasal pack. So you slide your Follies catheter into the post nasal space. You then fill it with 8 ml of saline or distilled water. So you slide it along the post nasal space. You filled it with 8 to 10 ml of saline or distilled water and give it a gentle tug. Make sure it is like snugly fitting into the post nasal space. And then by giving a holding it downwards, you then pack the anterior nasal space in this area. So it's a combination where <coughs> the Follies catheter, it is, it is a combination where the Follies catheter is acting as your post nasal pack and your anterior nasal pack is then added onto it to give you a post nasal pack and an anterior nasal pack for this patient. So here we go, we slide a Follies catheter in, we, it's around 8 centimeters insertion. We then fill it with 8 ml of saline or water. So this is your post nasal pack and then you pack in your anterior nasal pack in this particular area. So it's a post nasal pack and an anterior nasal pack. After that, you tell the patient not to blow their nose because you don't want the air to get forced into the soft tissues around the maxilla. You tell the patient to avoid straining, bending forwards and the nasal pack will be removed in two to four days. The patient will need antibiotics also. <laughs> Let us end with a true published story. So basically, Dr. Tom Walker was working in a rural hospital in Ireland. He was faced with an RTA which had a bilateral fracture of the mandible. There was bleeding below the tongue. The tongue was raised and pushed back into his oropharynx because the attachment of the tongue in front was there against his bone. This bone got displaced backwards, taking the body of the tongue with it and therefore the patient lost physical control of the tongue and this tongue together with bleeding below the floor of the mouth was compromising his airway around the oropharyngeal region. So the patient was choking and there was excess bleeding. The patient was in full spinal immobilization 
and it was hard to maintain its airway. The only way they could do it was by suction, jaw thrust and by holding the mandible forwards. So the patient was in considerable pain. So the problems we had was there was bleeding, there was excess pain and there was a great difficulty in managing the airway. So what they had to do was they had to reduce and stabilize the anterior portion of the mandible. So they gave some local anesthesia, the dental local anesthesia to numb the patient up. They took a paper clip, they opened the paper clip making a straight wire and then using the dental local anesthesia, they tied a small bridal wire around the teeth, supporting the mandible and holding the mandible in the anterior position and thereby the tongue in the anterior position, preventing the tongue from falling back and then the patient was transferred to an oral surgeon for further treatment. This ends our presentation and I hope you find it useful. Thank you.